I always knew that I would be a synagogue leader. My grandfather was a religious leader, as was my father. It's in my blood. It's who God chose me to be. Thus, I take it seriously. I've been studying the Torah since I was a boy. I've tried to live by the law every day of my life. And I think all Jews should do the same. After all, the law is what we have to hold us together. It tells us what is right or wrong, good or bad, faithful or unfaithful. And if we don't follow the law, well, it's a slippery slope. Keep making exceptions to the rules, and it's not really a law anymore. It stops carrying weight and becomes more and more difficult to enforce. So you can imagine how I felt when Jesus came walking into my synagogue the other day. Of course, I'd heard rumors that he had no respect for the law, but it took me actually witnessing it myself to really believe it. It's the middle of the Sabbath. People are worshiping in the synagogue, and he just strolls in and calls Esther over to talk with him. Believe me, I'm the first to feel sorry for Esther. The poor woman has had an ailment that has caused her to be bent over for 18 years. I cannot imagine the pain she endures. God bless her. She still manages to come to synagogue every Saturday, as she should, a good law-abiding Jew. But Jesus all of a sudden has his hand on her back shouting, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Immediately, old Esther is standing upright, singing, dancing, praising God, disturbing the whole house of our Lord. As the synagogue leader, of course, I couldn't let this go on. Sure, I was happy Esther was standing upright, although I'm now a little skeptical about whether or not she was faking it all those years just to get a little sympathy. But rules are rules. I had to intervene. So I said, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. You know what Jesus had the nerve to call me? A hypocrite. That's right, a respected synagogue leader simply reminding everyone of the law, I'm the hypocrite? I think Jesus needs to go back and freshen up on his Torah. Read Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Exodus 28 through 11. Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. It's black and white, plain and simple. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh you rest. Instead of calling everyone else hypocrites, maybe Jesus should look in the mirror. Eighteen years ago, the village doctor told me that I would never walk upright again, something about a rare disease with no cure. He actually told me I would likely die from it in a couple of years. Well, I've showed him. Eighteen years later, here I still am going to synagogue every Saturday to observe the Sabbath. But I'm not going to lie, it has not been an easy 18 years. Imagine walking around staring at your feet all day long. Imagine never being able to look someone in the eye. Imagine the way that people in the market have judged me. I may as well have been a leper. Imagine having to be reliant on your husband to do every chore around the house and to work to make a living and to take, her, take care of you morning and night. Imagine the pain that I have felt in my back and my heart every day for the last 18 years. Well, you can also imagine then my surprise when Jesus walked into his synagogue that day. I had heard rumors about his ability to heal, the miracles he had done. Of course, I also knew it was Sabbath and that religious leaders, especially, were not to do anything but worship, teach, and pray. So when he called me over, I wondered what he wanted with me, what he was going to say. All of a sudden, his hand was on my back, and I, I didn't feel pain anymore. Immediately, I was no longer looking at the sandals on his feet, but rather straight into his eyes. In fact, I could see everyone's faces for the first time, and they were all looking at me, except not with pity or disgust, but with awe and wonder. Instinctively, without reservation, I felt compelled to yell, to dance, to throw my hands, to throw my arms up in the air and praise God. Instant joy came over me. Of course, it was momentarily squelched by Zechariah, the leader of our synagogue. He starts preaching at everyone about the Sabbath and how Jesus was breaking the law by healing me. Don't get me wrong, I am a law-abiding Jew. I take it seriously, more seriously than most. I certainly had a good excuse to not be at synagogue every Saturday for the last 18 years if I had chosen not to attend. However, the law is there for a reason, and I follow it. But how could the relief I experienced from my 18-year ailment be a bad thing? How could the joy I felt be sinful? 
how could this excitement of the whole, how could the excitement of the whole synagogue not be part of God's excitement that I had been healed? How could this miracle not be God's doing? I understand the law is important, but so is this. Think about any conflicts that are happening right now. What was caught on camera? What was not caught on camera? Who is corrupt and who's not corrupt? Who is right? Who is wrong? Who is ethical? Who is not ethical? I don't know. Let's just think of some conflicts. I mean, just right here, standing here out of nowhere, I can kind of think about politicians in conflict. I can think about athletes that are in conflict. I can think about groups of people who are in conflict with church. I would venture to say there might even be conflict in your home. Maybe even this morning. Maybe there was conflict over who ate the last one. Maybe there was conflict over, I can't believe he looked at me like that. Maybe there was conflict over, mom, he touched me. Maybe there was conflict over what somebody said. There is conflict everywhere. And sometimes in the middle of conflict, our instinct is to look in the Bible and find all the answers. But if we looked in Scripture, what would we find? We would find more conflict. In fact, the Gospel of Mark alone has five conflict stories before you even get to chapter 3. I'm going to read two more conflicts. Mark chapter 2 says this. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? How he entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath, so that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they were watching him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. And then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Or to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. And he grieved at the hardness of their heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. For Jesus, the conflicts are always over the same thing. Healing, feeding, and resting. Always those three things. Jesus is always in trouble over healing, feeding, and resting because he's always healing the wrong way. He's claiming authority that they don't like him to claim while he heals. He's always in trouble with feeding because he eats with the wrong people. And he doesn't just eat with the wrong people. He tends to make stories about it. It's not good. And of course, on the day of rest, on this Sabbath day, Jesus is always working. And so, of course, there's a group of people who are out to get them for it. And those people are the Pharisees. The Pharisees are a group of people who abide by the law. 
They know the law. They want to keep the law. And they are very strict about the law. And there's absolutely no wiggle room. And so they're watching Jesus like a hawk just to sick him. Now, there are people who have used the Pharisees as a way to speak out against Jewish culture. And they talk about how it's the Jews' fault. Please never fall into that temptation. We are talking about the year 70 CE, 70 AD, at the time the gospel is written. Frankly, there are no Christians versus Jews the same way we think. We are all Pharisees at this time. And let's be honest, we all still have a little Pharisee in us right now. Do you remember the old jokes that used to go, you might be a redneck if, stay with me. There is a very famous, very well-respected theologian who decided to help people understand Pharisees. And so he wrote a few, you might be a Pharisee if jokes. And so I'm going to read a few of them. Why? Because they're funny. You know you're a Pharisee if you have ever shouted amen more than 51 times during one single sermon describing somebody else's problems. You might be a Pharisee if your black Bible is so big it takes two hands to hold it up and shake it at people. You might be a Pharisee if you think the world would be a better place if everyone were just like you. You might be a Pharisee. If you think Jesus may have overstepped the bounds just a little, turning water into wine. You know you're a Pharisee. If you think the lady bent over for 18 years could have waited one more day. You might be a Pharisee if you're perfect while nobody else is. We all have a little Pharisee in us, don't we? Because we all live with these double standards. It's okay for me to speed because I'm finishing my text message. It's not okay for that person, though. They should get off the phone and watch their speed. That child should. That adult should. That parent should. We are great at telling other people what they should or should not be doing. We create conflict doing that all the time. We create so much conflict judging someone else while defending ourselves. There was a great rabbi. He was the perfect, perfect law-abiding rabbi. But his one problem was that he absolutely loved golf. And this poor golfer rabbi, he never had time to play golf. He was very, very busy. And so one day he decided... I am going to find a time in my busy schedule, and I'm going to play golf, and it's going to be wonderful. So he looked at the schedule, and he found the perfect day. It was wide open. He had nothing going on. And he looked up his very favorite golf course, which was far away, so no one in the temple would know where he was. They could never trace him there. And so he went. And he played golf at this wonderful course on this very free day called Sabbath. And so as he goes and he makes the first tee, the angel looks down on him and says, Oh, no. Here we have a perfect law-abiding rabbi. I'm going to go tell on him. So the angel tells God, God, you have got a rabbi who is working on the Sabbath. You need to do something about this. Well, by the third hole, the rabbi gets up and he makes his third drive off the tee. And God sent a huge gust of wind and takes the ball and, of course, puts it right into the hole. It's the rabbi's first hole in one. And the angel goes, that's not really a punishment, God. And God said, yeah, it is. He can't tell anybody about it. (laughs) Thank you. It took a minute. Thank you. (laughs) We live in tension of the rules all the time. 
We live not knowing how to keep them ourselves and wanting to fudge a little bit. We're not always sure what to do. We're constantly living in tension with the rules and with the laws. And scripture is so clear. Scripture says Sabbath was made for humankind. Humankind was not made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for us. Healing was made for us. Communion was made for us. Resting was made for us. Love was made for us. Forgiveness was made for us. Grace was made for us. And so we are always living in this conflict and this tension of the law versus grace. And it's almost like living in this tension of going to temple and reading the Torah, going to church and reading the Old and New Testament and learning the rules and learning the laws and learning the commandments and being in tension with the idea of true worship of one God. When really, worship is not an obligation. It's a response to the law. Worship is a response that we have to God. It's not a rule. It's a response. And when we figure that out, we know that when we walk away from church, when we walk away from worshiping, we are healed and fed and rested. And we can in turn turn around and make sure those around us are healed and fed and rested. If we have been forgiven, why not forgive? If we have been loved, why not love? If we have been brought in, why not bring others? It's almost like saying, Here we are. We have been bent over for years and years and years, staring at the one way it all has to be. No matter what, we have blinders on, and we've been seeing the same thing and studying the same thing, and this is all we know. When worship can be about standing up, looking around with a new lens, with a new focus, with a new perspective, with new eyes, And extending love to all those that we've met and will meet. And then we are the ones in the field picking grain because somebody's hungry that day. The answer is not the law. The answer is our response to it. Amen. And here we have this table set before us, which is one of the conflicts, isn't it? Eating and healing and being in communion. That one night that Jesus had with his friends. And so we too gather here looking for the same. And so I'd remind us that on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so now we pray this prayer of pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And Lord, this day we do pray for the many people in our minds. There are names of family members and of friends that are going through many trials. So we offer those names to you. And Lord, there are names of those in our own community. We know that there has been a baby born to a Chapel Roswell family and to them We say congratulations, but Lord, also bring that family into a very special time right now so they can begin to be closer together. 
We know, too, there are members of our youth who are traveling, who are experiencing mission, experiencing mission in Puerto Rico. So be with them. Be with the leaders. Be, too, with our greater community where we are. There are people in our city all the way around the world waiting for clean water. So be amongst them. And, Lord, right here in this space, from the people in our production booth to the people in the band and all of us in the middle. May you continue to hold us together as your community. May we be your representatives in this world, helping others to see you and experience you and learn more about you. Help us to be those looking in scripture for all of the stories, the stories of you and how we can experience more of it. We pray all of these things with the confidence of the children, of your children, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I would invite those who are assisting in communion to come forward. And as they come forward, I would remind everyone that this is God's table. This is not a table of Roswell United Methodist, of Chapel Roswell, or even of our denomination. This is a table only from God, and so you are invited to receive if you would like. And as they divvy up stations, I will also let you know that we have a um, we have several options. We have a gluten-free option. We also have the option if you just prefer the all-in-one, you may come right here in the middle. If you prefer to have the separate bread pinched off and dip it in the cup known as intinction, you may go to the sides. And so at this time, the table is open. Come and receive.